Uh, yes, WeChat owns China and is well on its way uh, here in the United States. As Professor Dong said, when you meet someone uh, from China, uh, it's not a business card they're after, they're after your WeChat identity and so that they can link up uh, quite easily with you. That was terrific and we'll have a chance for your questions after the next presentation. The next presenter is Matt Sheehan and Matt is a California product, uh, went to school here in the Bay Area and then went to China where he reported for the Huffington Post and wrote on a real sweep of issues, including technology issues. And so now, as a fellow at the Paulson Institute, he's in fact working, continuing to work on technology questions, uh, and they have a, a newsletter uh, or blog called Macro Polo. Macro, not Marco. Macro Polo. And he is, uh, uh, he likes to coin words, and this is a word that I think you need to hold on to. In addition to Idai Lu, you have to hold on to Chinafornia. Chinafornia. And so we have now to talk about the linkages between California and China through Matt Sheehan. Please welcome him. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I was in China for about five years, the last two as a correspondent for the Huffington Post. I moved back to the Bay Area here where I grew up last year, and now I'm continuing to sort of write and report and consult on issues connecting China and California. That's leading towards a book, Chinafornia, um, which is going to cover the different ways that California and China are coming together. And one of the main arguments is that for a long time, the U.S.-China relationship has been a very distant, very elite-focused thing. It's been something that goes on between presidents or between you know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. But in the last couple of years, we've really seen the U.S.-China relationship kind of come down to a grassroots level where it's about people interacting with people, schools, students, technology companies. And it's a really exciting development, and I think that we're really seeing the crux of it, the core of this new wave of U.S.-China relations here in California. There's a lot of reasons for that, like the long-standing Chinese community here, but also because in California, we happen to have what the Chinese people and the Chinese government most want for the next decade on a personal level, on an economic development level, on a technological level. We're home to you know, the two of the main things that China's looking to drive its economy are technology and a consumer-driven economy, something that's driven by entertainment, by you know, Disney, by purchases of stuffed animals related to movies, stuff like that. And we in California have the core of that as well in Hollywood. So yeah, I'll jump right into it. What I'm talking about today is China's Silicon Valley paradox. Um, and I'll explain what that means. That logo right there, that's my little Chinafornia logo. Hashtag it, tweet it, you know, spread, spread the good word. Um, we'll, we'll just jump right into it. So opening question, what are these people doing and why do they represent a new paradigm in China-US tech relations? So what are they doing? They are doing an earlobe massage train between them. This is, uh, this is members of a company called Mobvoi. Um, it's a company that I first encountered back here and then reported on back in China. And the guy at the front there is Li Zhifei, Li being his last name, Zhifei is given name. And he is somebody who's a real good example of a new paradigm in China-US tech relations. And that's what I'm going to sort of unravel over the course of this talk and then bring it back around to Li Zhifei and show why I think that his company can teach us a lot about the direction that the technological relationship is going. So first, we'll break it down into a couple of broad phases in the relationship between Silicon Valley here and Chinese tech. First phase I would call dependence. That's 1994 when China first gets hooked into the global internet. And it goes to around the period of 2001. These are you know, rough estimates, but I'll, I'll unpack them as we go. The next phase after dependence is competition. This is when you start to see Chinese and US tech companies going head to head in the Chinese market. Third phase that we're in right now is what I'd call segmentation and synergy. And you know, on face, those two terms are opposites. They, they don't work together. Segmentation is about dividing up things, and synergy is about bringing them together and producing something that's sort of stronger and better from that. And that's kind of the paradox that 
uh, is co like core to the relationship right now, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So just to set that up, I'm, I think through the relationship of Silicon Valley and China, we also see the re just the development of China's own tech industry. So first, I'm going to give a couple of sort of framing questions and then dive into it. So first set of framing questions is about setting up a sort of the great reversal that's happened over the last 20 plus years in the way that people think about Chinese technology. So you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even as recently as five years ago, the real questions out there, the questions that analysts are asking is how is the global internet going to change China's authoritarian politics? It's can China thrive without access to Google? And it's can Chinese companies really innovate? Can they be truly innovative companies when they're operating in an environment of censorship? And I would argue that in large part over the last five years or so, we've, these questions have been completely reversed. Oh, new questions. It's not how is the global internet going to change Chinese politics, but how are Chinese politics going to change the global internet? It's not can China thrive without Google, it's can Google thrive without China. And it's not can Chinese companies operate in an environment of sense or innovate in an environment of censorship, but can US companies keep up with Chinese innovation going forward? That obviously Silicon Valley is still the core, the heart of global innovation, but especially in areas like artificial intelligence, you've seen a real rocketing ahead of China that in many ways has actually been enabled by censorship, has been enabled by the fact that they live in a protected market and develop their own companies. So those are the questions that sort of set up this great reversal we've seen in Chinese tech. And as teachers here, I think one of the best things that we can do is give you some questions to chew over with your students. And one that I think is core to not just the technological relationship, but something you see in a lot of different areas, in education, in almost any place where US institutions or people are interacting directly with China. And this is the question of how to engage with an ethically unsavory government. Do you opt for messy engagement, you know, working with the Chinese government, working with Chinese institutions, in some sense buying into their project for the sake of getting in touch, for the sake of bringing people together? Or do you take the moral high ground? Do you say, you know what, it's too messy over there. I don't want to engage in a place that uh, does censorship. I don't want to uh, open an academic institution in a place where there are not academic freedoms. I think that I can do more good by stepping back and taking sort of a moral stand. That's a question that sounds kind of abstract there, but actually gets very real and very tangible um, these days, and one of the best areas to sort of examine that is in technology. So now let's go into the stages. First stage is dependence, 1994 to 2001. 1994 is when China first hooks into the global internet. It actually happened through a connection between Stanford, the linear accelerator here, and a Chinese university. Brought China online, and these early years, the Chinese internet really was a backwater. It was exciting, it was new, it was fresh, but it was not driving forward global innovation. The money that founded so many Chinese internet companies was coming from US venture capital. The talent, the people that were founding these internet companies were often Chinese who had studied in the US and had returned to China. And the ideas, you know, what is an internet company? What's a success, what, what sells on the internet? What works on the internet? A lot of those ideas were coming directly from the US. They were taking companies like Yahoo and creating the Chinese version you know, Sohu or other portal sites. So the Chinese internet is really feeding off of Silicon Valley in that way. And, you know, you kind of have like a little brother, big brother relationship, although, you know, Silicon Valley might not even have said they're brothers at that point. China, Chinese people who were involved were very much looking up to the valley and looking to it for inspiration. In terms of innovation, if you want to say what was the first quote unquote innovation from China, indigenous innovation, that would, you'd probably call it the firewall. You know, this was at a time when the ideas about what the internet was were, it was this kind of force of nature, something that was totally not going to be bound by nation states, not going to be bound by the laws of countries. And China was one of the first places to really say like, no, actually we're gonna control this. We're going to assert what websites our people can visit. And at the time, you know, calling it an innovation, but at the time it was uh, something that was very much dismissed by especially commentators in the West. Bill Clinton really, oops, Bill Clinton had the best line on this one. 
So he, in a speech where he's welcoming China into the WTO, he says, you know, look, the internet is already totally reshaping America, and we're already an open society. What's going to do in China? And then he drops his famous line. He says that controlling the internet is like trying to nail jello to the wall. That's like a classic, you know, Bill Clinton sort of down-home phrase, but it really, it captures something about it. It captures this idea that no matter how many pegs you put in the, how many nails you put in the wall, no matter how many bricks you put in the firewall, the jello is always going to fall off. The internet is like water. It's going to spread freely, and it's going to spread to, you know, wherever, wherever the people want it. So that's kind of the setup in this early age. China is very much dependent on Silicon Valley, and we think that their ideas about controls on the, in the, on the internet are doomed to fail. Second phase, competition. So in this slide, we put up two, two dichotomies, two competitions, eBay versus Alibaba and Google versus Baidu. Nowadays, when you think you know, eBay versus Alibaba, it's like a no-brainer. Alibaba, global giant. eBay, total joke. Like, I'm sorry if anybody here still uses eBay. It's, that's, le that's a legitimate choice. But we have to remember <laughs> that at the time, it was completely reversed. At the time, eBay was the big, bad internet company, was the boss, you know, was one of the most valuable technology companies in the world. And Alibaba was the joke. Alibaba was this backwater company founded by a short little guy named Jack Ma who kind of looks like E.T. and, you know, just like sounds off crazy like. So, you know, that was the setup. And people thought eBay is going to roll into China and eBay is going to crush. eBay is going to destroy Alibaba. It's going to take over the Chinese e-commerce market. And that's going to be the end of the story. Um, somewhat similar dichotomy with Google and Baidu. Google, it was a somewhat younger company, but it was also seen as the best, the gold standard. And people assume that it's going to roll in there and it's going to crush Baidu. Baidu being a company that was actually founded by someone, uh, Robin Lee, a coworker of our friend back there, Kaiser Guo, our former coworker, um, who spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, sort of worked up his chops here and was very much inspired by um, Jerry Yang, the founder of Yahoo, and sort of brought a lot of that back to China with him. So we have this idea that uh, you know, eBay, Google, the big bad guys are going to roll in there and they're going to crush the competition. But the, the opposite proves to be true. Alibaba's like you know, the guerrilla army that's taking on the great global uh, colonial force. And, and they kill them. They destroy them. Um, they do it by being faster, by being more responsive to Chinese us users' needs, by basing their servers, their technology, and their teams all in China, whereas eBay is trying to kind of control its China operations for, for, from afar. Google versus Baidu is more complicated because there's a much stronger element of government control in there in related to what you search, what the search providers are allowed to give to you. And we're going to dig into that a little bit. So this period of competition is also when you start to see the first moral dilemmas, this question of messy engagement versus moral high ground. So I'll just give one example as a starter. This guy on the left is Shi Tao, a Chinese journalist. And it ended up being him versus Yahoo and the Chinese Communist Party. So Shi Tao was an editor at a newspaper in central China. And in 2004, so the 15th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre of 1989, the government, when an anniversary like this comes around, the government sends out sort of orders about how this should be covered. Should this be talked about? How should you frame it? And they said, you know, don't talk about it, basically. And Shi Tao took those instructions and he sent them to an overseas Chinese human rights website in New York, I believe. And just to you know, get the word out, spread the word on, uh, and expose the censorship regime, basically. But the Chinese government wanted to know who did that. And they went to Yahoo and they said, basically, who sent these emails? And Yahoo handed over the information. They handed over Shi Tao, and that information was used to put him in prison. He was in prison for, I think, eight years total. And when that news came out, you know, Yahoo came under tons of fire. They're called in front of Congress to testify. How could you sell out this guy? How could you sell out human rights? Yahoo, they're apologetic, but you can also see where they're, what their thinking was. Their thinking is, you know, ah, we've invested tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars to get into China. And if we don't cooperate with this regime, we're going to be kicked out, and it's kind of all going to be for naught. So this is one of the first and in terms of human impact, you know, there's a clear victim here. It's one of the first examples of companies trying to deal with that. Google, as it was debating its entry, is uh, dealing with a similar question. And it's, you know, Google's trademark phrase, back then at least, was don't be evil. But 
if you take don't be evil to mean you cannot censor, you cannot control content in that way with a government, then it basically means you can't operate here. You can have no part of the Chinese market. So Google, its leaders kind of agonized over this for years. Eric Schmidt here describes them actually doing an evil scale, you know, this kind of like moral metric. And the, the fundamental question is that they're working on is, do we think that by going into China, we're going to be expanding the total realm of Chinese internet connectivity? Even if we are agreeing to censor, are we doing more to expand information access or are we sort of selling out and giving into the government? That's a decision where in 2006, Google decided, you know, it's worth it. It would be worse evil to not enter the market, to not participate in some way. So they enter in 2006, and between 2006 and 2010, they're in competition with Baidu. And it's actually, a lot of folks in, you know, in retrospect sort of tell the story of Google was, you know, just hobbled by the government from the beginning. But even, uh, Baidu was actually a, a much more localized company at the time. And even some Google employees who were there at the time said that Baidu's search technology in Chinese was actually better. So it wasn't purely a government issue. They're engaged in very fierce competition, and it all kind of comes to a head in 2010 when Google exits China. The cause of the exit was not just that Google got fed up with censorship or that it got totally beat. Um, Google and Gmail users were actually the subject of a cyber attack of hacking of Gmail accounts. It was actually, it was while I was at Stanford, a girl who was of Tibetan origin uh, who was an activist in the Tibetan community, had her Gmail account hacked by the Chinese government. And for Google, uh, at least in the, this was sort of the last straw. They said, you know what, that's it. We don't want to engage with this government anymore. We're not willing to censor our search results anymore, and we're packing up and leaving. So they leave in 2010. At this point, you have, again, these questions coming back up. You know, can China possibly become a first-rate global economy in this environment without Google in? And you have another aspect. It's not just coming from foreign internet companies coming into China and kind of friction along those lines. Oops. You also, hey, you'll. Um, social media at this time. This is the rise of Weibo, which has now sort of been suppressed by WeChat, but at the time it was a real force. This is a, it, it's, people call it the Chinese Twitter. It was the space where a lot of discussions of Chinese political events happen. And it was in the early years, the government really didn't know what to do about it. They didn't know how to properly control it. Um, this was a Chinese company. It wasn't blocked by the firewall. This all came to a head in 2011 during the Wenzhou high-speed train crash. And that was a high-speed rail in a storm. Uh, an electrical box was knocked out by some lightning. Trains crashed, and Chinese social media exploded with discussion about it. It was kind of turned into this metaphor for Chinese high-speed development going out of control. People feeling, you know, our milk's not safe to drink, our air's not safe to breathe, it's not safe to ride our trains, is it worth it? This was a real focal point for the, the sense that social media is going to be a force for change. Social media is going to force the government into changing. But instead of social media totally derailing, you know, government control efforts, hey, you had this, you had a crackdown on Weibo. The guy behind bars there is named Charles Xue. He was a um, Chinese-born, uh, lived in the U.S. for a long time, a, a internet investor, and a very active presence on Weibo. He was kind of fanning the, you know, adding fuel to the fire in conversation about um, stuff like the train crash and other social issues. And the Chinese government, as an example, made, sort of made an example out of him. They arrested him on charges of soliciting a prostitute, made him confess on live TV, but really he was confessing to, you know, being an internet commentator. And so this was kind of, in Chinese they call it, what, uh, kill the chicken to scare the monkey is a phrase. And Charles Shui was the chicken in this, you know. Make a very public example that the internet is not a free space for conversation. It could land you behind bars like him. So again, we're back to these same questions everyone's asking at this time, 2010 to 2013, you know. How is this going to change the Chinese government? Can China thrive? Can China be truly innovative? But instead of withering the Chinese internet ecosystem completely booms. This is, this period starting in around 2012, 2013 is kind of a golden age, like a renaissance for the Chinese internet. You have, on the left here, you have Jack Ma, the ET looking guy, um, having the highest value uh, IPO ever on the, on the New York Stock Exchange, really woke the world up to like the economic opportunity there. Uh, on the right there, you have WeChat, of course, which we just heard a lot about. 
And down here is just an example of uh, the connectivity between everyday life and the internet. This is a guy selling hongshu, these um, sweet potatoes on the street in China. A lot of times people are selling these out of what looks like an oil drum, you know, and he just like bakes them in there and takes them out. This guy <laughs> is, he's, his payment methods are there on the right. It's QR codes, those little boxes that look kind of like uh, barcodes. If you want to buy a, you know, 12 cent uh, sweet potato from the street vendor, you take out your WeChat, you scan it, and you pay them that way. And, you know, this is, you really see this period of connectivity, we call it online to offline, is one of the main things that boomed there. The idea that you can just, on WeChat, like we saw in the video, you can order up your noodles, you can have somebody come to your house and, you know, do your nails. This is a period where we're seeing a ton of different internet companies, but also the big Chinese internet companies just having, kind of stepping into their own, stepping onto the world stage, and showing that China can innovate, can bring new business models. So we're back to Li Jifei, and what I'll argue is sort of the new paradigm here. So Li Jifei, in this whole period of time, he's been in the mix. He's been at very key places throughout this process. So first we'll kind of trace his journey. He's born, um, he's I think in his late 30s now, he's born in central China in uh, the province of Hunan. Um, he goes to Beijing in those early internet boom years. That's Beijing in the northeast of China. He gets involved in China's early internet companies, but at this time it's still, you know, it's still a backwater. The U.S. is still where the action is. So he goes to Johns Hopkins University for a PhD in computer science, gets very involved with machine learning, artificial intelligence, starts to make a name for himself in that kind of research. In 2010, just as Google is pulling out of China, Li Jifei is entering Google. So he worked in Google Translate on their algorithms, not just on, not on Chinese English translation that way, on really cutting edge uh, machine learning technology and was making a name for himself in research and was moving up the ranks there. But in 2012, when he wanted to found his own company, found his own startup, he decided he wanted to do that in China. That's where his resources were, that's where his edge was. You know, when he's in the US, he's the 5,000th uh, Chinese guy working at Google. When he's back in China, he's one of a very elite core of ex-Googlers who are in China, somebody who's really looked up to over there. So he moves back to Shanghai in 2012 and founds this company, Mobvoi, Chinese name Chumen Wenwen. Um, and eventually he, he moves the company to Beijing. Chumen Wenwen, Mobvoi, is, at, in the early years it was framed as the Chinese Siri for Android devices. So something where you can you know, call up your phone and say, hey, you know, I want some Sichuan food, like where can I go? And it'll just come up with answers on the map there for you. What's interesting to me is that when he moved from Google back to China, bringing the skills that he learned, bringing the culture that he adopted or that he absorbed in Silicon Valley, when he moved back over to China, he also moved to a place where Android services, Google services are blocked. So he's in some ways taking these cutting edge skills that he learned and taking him to a place where he has a certain competitive advantage as well. And that's that, you know, Google's, uh, you can't on an Android phone search, voice search with uh, Google Maps. If you're using a smartwatch, you can't uh, check your email, check your Gmail through voice technology because it's blocked. So he's crossing back over the line, back into sort of the somewhat protected world of the firewall and founding his own company. Back to this. So this is 2015. This is, I went with the company, I went with Mobvoi as they um, launched a smartwatch hackathon. And this was actually the, the very same day that the Apple Watch launched in the US. Um, and then you could start to buy it. And what Mobvoi was doing was they wanted to build their own uh, operating system for smartwatches because Android Wear, the Google system for wearables, you know, watches, Google Glass, stuff like that, uh, was unusable in China. So they said, we'll create our own local version of it. And they used this hackathon to um, build out the apps for it. This is their icebreaker at the very beginning of it, which in some way kind of feels googly to me. What, what Jirfei always says is uh, that he used Google DNA. His company has Google DNA in it. It's that culture of innovation, the culture of relatively flat um, management structures where everybody has sort of a say in it, not hierarchical, not the traditional sort of top-down Chinese company, but you know, goofy, fun, they're out there. Um, and so the same, what I was just describing about Jirfei taking the skills from other parts of the world is true of the whole company. The whole, Mavoy is stocked with elite talent who 
in many cases got their training in the US. Uh, Harvard Business School, ex-Googlers, people who worked at Microsoft, graduates of Stanford, money from Sequoia Capital or its Chinese arm, and then also some of the best of China. It has people from Tsinghua, it has people from Baidu. So it, oops, just pressed down and that went away. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, it, you know, inside the firewall, inside Mobvoi, you have the elite of the United States, but you don't have access to US services in the form of Android Wear. Um, over the next couple of years, this picture on the left is from the actual hackathon, these people hashing out. The app that they were building at that moment, I believe, was um, something where you could just say to your watch, hey, uh, let me know when the Beijing air pollution goes above 200 so I don't go outside. And then your watch will sort of send you a quick alert about that. So very, you know, a very China-centric uh, function, but built by people who have their training in the US in a lot of cases. In the years following this, what's interesting to me is, you know, Google doesn't harbor a grudge about this. They don't say, Jeffe, you know, how could you leave our company and go found a competitor in this company, we, in this country we can't operate in? Google instead decides to work with Mobvoi. Soon after this hackathon, Google invests money into Mobvoi. They form a strategic partnership with Mobvoi, where Mobvoi functionally becomes the Chinese operator of the Android Wear app store. So these, co these companies are separated by the firewall, but the exchange between them is very fluid. The exchange of money, the exchange of people, and the exchange of ideas is very fluid. That's what brings us to the new paradigm, what I'd call the sort of segmentation and synergy. In terms of synergy, you have totally fluid flows of people, of money, and ideas. That's going back and forth between the countries and between the companies. Um, you know, talent is leaving China and going to Google. And, you know, Google's like second language at the Mountain View campus is Chinese. I go there to eat lunch with my girlfriend and it's just Mandarin all around me. Um, but you also have those same people going to China. You have uh, investment flows between the two places and you have the whole idea of what an internet company should be or ideas for new markets and new apps flowing between the places. But, oh yeah keep doing that. The companies can't make that leap. So over here on the US side, Google, Uber, Facebook, Twitter, or Snapchat, Twitter, over there, Baidu, DD is the Uber competitor, Alibaba, WeChat, Weibo. In a lot of cases, the US companies face the firewall, but they also face cultural differences. They face the fact, like the same way that eBay couldn't win over Chinese users. Chinese companies, they don't face a firewall going abroad, but they face a real inability to hook in US users. Um, that's partly cultural, that's partly when you're in China, this is something I actually learned or crystallized for me listening to the Seneca podcast, an interview with Clay Shirky. The fact that when you're an operating in China, one of your key strengths is your ability to work with the Chinese government. If you're you know, Baidu or Alibaba, the fact that you know how to pull the strings, you know how to operate in China, that's one of your biggest competitive advantages. But it doesn't mean anything anywhere else in the world. That doesn't help you in Malaysia, that doesn't help you in France or in the United States. So Chinese companies are kind of held back by the fact that they have to adapt to the firewall, and US companies in many cases are held back by the firewall itself. Here, I think since I'm a little bit limited on time, I'll just go through this very quickly. This is some of the flows of people. Andrew Ng, one of the most elite artificial intelligence researchers in the world, Stanford professor, worked at Google. He went to Baidu here in Silicon Valley. Li Jufei to Google. Hugo Barra, another very elite Googler, went over to China and worked for Xiaomi, and now is back in the US working for Facebook. So those exchanges, very fluid. Money, the same thing. Tencent, the company that makes WeChat, invested a lot in Tesla. Um, Google invests in Mobvoi. This guy on the left is kind of your representative of Tuhao, you know, these kind of rich, uh, Tuhao is like a, it's like a, a country earthy rich dude, you know, a coal boss who made it big and now wants to get into technology. In the last few years, those guys have showed up in force in Silicon Valley. You know, they, they, they recognize the coal industry is going downhill in China. They're like, oh, Silicon Valley, you know, that's good. I'm, going to go and invest, and they've really flooded into the valley and spread a lot of money around really fast with some uh, very mixed results. But those exchanges are all fluid. I, my thumb is too fat for this clicker. Um, so that, yeah, the paradox of the new paradigm in summary. The flows of these people, money, and ideas are at an all-time high, but companies, and in some ways the internet itself, as we saw in that video, is as divided as it's ever been by national boundaries, at least between China and the rest of the world. So. Uh, <laughs> to, to kind of bring a lot of it together and to give what I hope would be uh, food for use in discussion with your students, we'll look at an example of Mark Zuckerberg and 
his take on that, you know, messy engagement versus moral high ground. For the last five or so years, Mark Zuckerberg has been on a mission to get into China. Google has been blocked there since about 2009, and Zuckerberg has been doing everything in his power to win over the Chinese people, to win over the Chinese government, and to get Facebook back in. A couple of quick examples here. Language. Zuckerberg, in secret, uh, somehow without anybody knowing, between 2010 and 2014, logged a lot of hours learning Chinese. And it was impressive. In 2014, he made his sort of Chinese-speaking debut. He shows up at a Q&A session at Tsinghua, one of the most elite universities there. Everyone's expecting, you know, an English conversation, and he just busts out Mandarin. And he just, he does a full, like, 20-minute question and answer entirely in Mandarin. His accent is terrible. Um, it's, it's messy, but respect, you know? As somebody who put in the hours to learn the language as well, nothing but respect for that move. Then it gets a little bit dicier. This other picture is him welcoming Lu Wei, a um, sort of the censor-in-chief, or the former censor-in-chief of the Chinese internet, the guy who's blocking his company, welcoming him to Silicon Valley. And they're buddies, you know, oh, Lu Wei, so good to see you, man, you know, love your stuff. When Lu Wei comes and visits Zuckerberg's desk, Zuckerberg has a copy of Xi Jinping, the Chinese president's book on his desk. Says, oh, you know, <laughs> this old thing, you know? I give this to all my colleagues. Pretty, pretty shame. He's in Beijing there in the bottom left. He, he has a very well-staged photograph of him jogging past uh, Tiananmen Square in the Forbidden City. You know, horrible smog. I played Frisbee in Beijing for many years. I would not go out in that smog. But he's in there with his, you know, Facebook status. Great to be back in Beijing. You know, love you guys. And, but where it really, you know, that's, it's fun in games, but where it really gets messy is here in the bottom right. Facebook said to create a censorship tool to get back into China. Facebook working on tools that, would, that it could give to another party, to a Chinese partner or the Chinese government, that would allow it to censor content so that there's a kind of a Chinese Facebook where if I were to share a post about Tiananmen Square or another sensitive issue like Tibet or Taiwan, that post between me and my friend Kai in Jiangxi or in Beijing, the post would get cut off. He would never know that I had posted it. He would never see it. So you're kind of reinforcing this idea that the internet, it's, it's legitimate for the internet to have these barriers, to have these censorship barriers. Um, despite all those efforts, Facebook remains blocked, and the paradox facing the companies is as, as stark as ever. Very quickly to wrap up, questions that I think are good, would be good food for thought with your students. Um, number one, does a country have a right to regulate its own internet? Is it, it, are there any situations where it's legitimate to block content? This, you know, for a long time, people in the U.S. took a very hard line, no, no, no. But you saw uh, with the whole debate about fake news on Facebook in the run-up to the election and the way that that aided Donald Trump, people started to be a little bit more wishy-washy. Mm, maybe there is a space for, uh, you know, putting, uh, keeping out fake news. Or in Europe, they, block, they have something called the right to be forgotten. The fact that if there's information about you on the internet that you don't like, and that you feel is outdated, you know, a video of you being wasted singing in the street in college, and now you're 40, Europe allows you to remove that uh, video from the internet. Last question here, and this is the real heart of it, messy engagement versus moral high ground. You know, I'd ask the students, if you were Mark Zuckerberg, what would you do? Is there value to bringing Chinese users into a social network where they'll have more exchange with people in America, but that won't be political exchange? Is there value to bringing in Google and giving Chinese users tools that are very useful for their businesses, but you'll also cut off their searches for sensitive terms? Is it better to slightly expand that realm of connectivity and information, even if it means reinforcing the censorship barriers, the political barriers, or is it better to sort of take a stand and say like, no, we're not gonna participate in that? I think that's a very open question, and I think it's something that'd be good to talk over with your students. So. Thank you very much. That's some contact info on some of my own stuff.